Okay, let's try this. I'm doing a Q&A on Instagram anyway, so I figured uh, maybe I'd try on here, see if any of my YouTube subscribers have any questions that they want me to answer. So ask away, I will do my best. Let's see if anybody even comes in here since I've never done one of these before and I didn't schedule it. <clears throat> Thanks, Fernando. I'll see, maybe I'll do some of these Instagram ones at the same time. A lot of questions on the Instagram ask me anything had to do with sort of my favorite watches or things like that. These are always really hard questions to answer or like grail watches. Um, I think I answered that the Philippe Dufour Grand Sonnery would be my like grail if I could have anything watch, which, you know, why not? It's a, it's an amazing watch. They're impossible to get. I think he made six of them. Um, but such a tough call. You know, another question was like, what, uh, if I could only have one watch, what would it be? And then it's just like, well, what, what's the actual situations? Like I, I think my, I've mentioned before, but my favorite watch that I own in my personal collection, what I think is sort of the most important watch that I've owned um, is a uh, unique Kari Voodalainen decimal repeater that I have. And um, <clears throat> uh, is the Aishi 2 comparable to the simplicity? I've never actually seen one of these Aishi uh, watches in person. They don't really interest me so much. Um, a lot of the simplicity thing comes out of just the lore around Philippe Dufour. And uh, so as an object, I would imagine that they are comparable, uh, but as, but the simplicity is more than just what it is as an object. It's a, it's a cult watch and uh, has its own sort of yeah, following and lore around it. So uh, I, I don't think anybody anything could ever compare to that. Uh, maybe I'll do a full podcast on my sort of simplicity thoughts at some point. Uh, I'll get back to my story another time because I have actual questions. Would I review something unusual below 100K? Uh, I have tons of watches below 100K uh, on my channel. Uh, the Urworks are almost all below 100. The MBNFs are almost all below 100. Almost all the genre. I mean, almost everything I've I've reviewed is below 100. Only really the Grubles, you know, I don't know, some of the Tourbillons above 100, but most is below. And then you say below 10K or 5K. Now this gets a little bit difficult. There aren't a lot of uh, interesting watches and I just, it's not my business. You know, I review the watches that I own and that come in here that are my my inventory. And I don't really buy 5,000 or even $10,000 watches. It's, it's not really where my business is focused. So uh, certainly when I do get things in, like uh, I think I actually mentioned on the Instagram one, the, the I think Sarpaneva is really cool and a lot of them are under 10. Um, then I'll review them, but under five, I don't I don't really buy anything under five. Um, unfortunately, I wish there were cooler watches under five and I hope that one day there will be, but also as a business, it's just not what people come to me for. And I don't do enough volume to be able to make a, a living selling $2,000 watches. My opinion to the AHCI, I mean, when, when I was getting into independent watches, the AHCI was a really big deal. Um, everybody knew kind of who was in it and what they were doing, and it was a, a very honorable, big thing. Uh, now it's not, I don't know if they haven't done the marketing or if nobody really pays attention. This was kind of on the purists. Everybody paid attention to the AHCI, and it was even called the AHCI Forum, and this was like the main hub of information on independent watchmaking. Um, 
but now nobody really pays so much attention. So I don't know if it's still super relevant. Maybe in Switzerland it is, uh, but here amongst collectors, I don't, I don't think it is. Um, <clears throat> guys like uh, Thomas Pressure and Andre Streller are amazing. Um, some of their early watches are awesome. Thomas Presser is still making amazing things. Streller make, mainly makes cool stuff for other people. Uh, but neither of them have done a great job of actually creating a brand. Uh, so their watches are very difficult to sell. Um, you know, there, there's a, uh, and, and then uh, Daniels, you mentioned in there, who's obviously, you know, one of the greatest and, and Roger Smith has done a lot to kind of cement his legacy. But there's sort of a make or break point for an independent watchmaker. It's like, it's all well and good to just make great watches and be totally unknown. You have to do some level of marketing and brand building to make people comfortable in paying a lot of money for a watch, you know, beyond there are some really amazing patrons of independent watchmaking who will, uh, you know, who really go and visit the workshops and will will buy a really expensive watch just sort of from a guy. Uh, but most people want some sort of brand to be associated with it, some sort of marketing um, makes them feel a little bit more comfortable and uh, makes it possible to make a secondary market. It's very difficult to have a secondary market. Um, Otherwise, David Rutan Meteorite Watch. I'm not familiar with this at all. I need to go research it, I guess. Plans to review Beauvais. Again, I, I only review what I own. I think that makes me very much different than um, maybe any other YouTube channel. I mean, I guess the Watchbox reviews, like they own the stuff that they have, but it's not the owners that are reviewing the watches. Um, I've never owned a Beauvais. I don't buy them. I don't sell them. I, uh, I don't love the aesthetics personally. Some of them are kind of cool. So I'm not totally against it, but uh, I've never owned one. So I've never reviewed one. Thoughts on Voodalinen? I mean, I think I'm well on the record with, uh, with this one. I've done several Kari reviews. I own in my personal collection uh, what I think is the most important watch that he's ever made. Um, I think he's the best. I love Kari. Uh, I think he's a he's a great guy also. He's done a great job with his brand. I think he's incredibly underrated. Um, people take for granted that he is around and making stuff right now. Uh, and if he were to stop or slow down his production, people would realize that the stuff that he's made is is really important and amazing. And uh, yeah, uh, nothing's better than Akari in my mind. Oh, love your work. Please recommend some good uh, Instagram accounts to follow. So I'll be more exposed to independence. Ooh, what do I follow that's good on independence? Ah, I'm not totally sure, to be honest. Um, I mean, obviously the brands that you like, uh, there's some, there are some good collectors like, like Gabe, uh, what's his, hold on. I, I, I never remember people's uh, Instagram handles. Well, I don't know if you guys are good with that. I, I'm terrible at it. Um, da, da, da. NYC watch guy it, uh, has some good stuff. Um, yeah. Gabe is, let me, hold on. Let me see what he is. Uh, GVA 212. Uh, he's got some good posts sometimes, although he mainly posts in stories nowadays. Uh, let me look and see who else I like on here. Um, obviously they're, um, they're one of the other dealers in my space, but a collected man, they take beautiful photos and they have cool inventory. Uh, sometimes we compete on the same pieces and with the same customers and clients, but Silas is a really nice guy and I really admire the uh, level of content that they make. That's a few. Uh, let's see, which FP Jorn watch under 50 to buy right now? Um, yeah, a lot of the old ones have now climbed above that. You can probably still find an old Okta under there if that's the kind of thing you're into. 
I feel like the Centigraph, I have one on my site right now, although it's kind of on hold, although I guess it's not, maybe it's available. Uh, I think the Centigraph is gonna be the next kind of like modern classic because there isn't a brass movement version. So a lot of people, they want the, they want the older resonance, they want the older tourbillon right now, um, stuff like that. But the Centigraph only came out with the gold movements in the 40 millimeter cases. So, uh, and, and it's a really amazing watch. It's, it's super complicated. Uh, it's very nice to wear. I think the rose gold with white dial version that I have is the nicest one. Um, so I would, I would say that one. An independent watch I didn't like, but I bought it for a little price. I don't totally understand that one. I'm sorry. Uh, what am I wearing? It's an Urwerk 210. I wear this watch maybe the most of anything. I love it. It's everything I want, basically. Uh, what are your thoughts on Breguet? I don't have a lot of thoughts on these big brands. Um, I think that uh, it's just sort of big corporate nonsense. They, they have a couple cool watches. I reviewed uh, the Tradition Tourbillon, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but overall, I'd put my money in indie stuff. Opinions on Roger Dubuis, old, new. Um, I have a lot of collectors that are getting into the old Roger Dubuis. It's a little bit hard for me because I remember back when they came out, nobody ever wanted them. They were kind of like dogs from the beginning and very difficult to sell. And uh, I don't know. I'm not sure why they've come back so much. I mean, they've always been nice watches and always pretty, but I feel like this push now to make them something more than that uh, is a little bit artificial. I think there's some big players in the market that are trying to manipulate it a little bit to have that happen. Um, they're not totally for me. Uh, and, and actually, I, I think some of the new Roger Dubuis is really cool. The like skeleton tourbillons and stuff. I owned one. I, I had one on my channel. Some of the cases are don't totally fit on my wrist that well, but otherwise I think they're pretty awesome. And the pricing is like totally insanely cheap and ridiculous. So a lot of good value for money there. Um, <clears throat> howdy from Myrtle Beach from the Watch Lounge. Myrtle Beach sounds like a nice place. Hi down there. I'm uh, in Los Angeles. It's been a little bit rainy the last few weeks, which I actually kind of like, and it's a little bit cold, uh, which I'll take. You know, we're talking like low 60s, so nothing like real winter where I grew up, but um, not so bad. Okay. Uh, boo, boo, boo. Not a cheap brand, but a good independent is Habring. Yeah, I could see that. I've actually never owned one. Um Something about them I've never totally loved, but uh, I've heard that that Richard and his wife are really nice people, and it's a cool. It's a, it is a very nice way to get into one of these uh, independent watches uh, on a budget. Uh, books. I don't really read a lot of watch books. Uh, you can see on my shelves, I have mainly art books. George Daniels watchmaking. This is sort of the Bible, technically at least. Doesn't get much better than that in terms of a watch book. There's one. Do I believe large gray market dealers are creating the hype that continues to drive the Rolex and Paddock bubbles? I don't know if they're creating the hype, but they, uh, are they creating the hype? Well, Rolex and Paddock are creating the hype by not supplying watches. Um, and then people are keeping the hype going by buying the watches at the prices that people are asking. Um, so no, I guess I don't believe that. But uh, I think where the gray market dealers come in is that a lot of guys start buying uh, all of these watches. And so a lot of them end up in the hands of these kind of middlemen, people who don't necessarily have the capital to buy inventory, but they're doing it because they perceive it to be kind of riskless. 
Um, you can buy a, you know, you buy a Nautilus one day for 30, you can sell it the next for 32, you can sell it the next for 34, you can sell it the next for 37, the next it's 45, the next it's 52, and they've just been going and going and going. And at some point, a lot of people come into this area and they're kind of willing to pay anything because they know they're going to sell it the next day and make even like 500 bucks or something. But when you have no margin like that and you're not well capitalized, and the pieces have gone up, uh, you know, 80% or 100% or even more in the last year or two years, that's where you start getting bubbles because at some point the prices come down, the buyers stop being there, and all of these have to precipitate out somehow, and these guys can't afford to keep them, and they paid too much money for them, and uh, so you get this boom, crash effect that's more than it would be otherwise. And I guess I suppose that helps the way up also all this extra liquidity in the market. Do, do, do. Opinion on Jean-Daniel Nicola. Um, oh, they're great, it's a beautiful handmade tourbillon. Um, not much to argue with there, except the fact that the aesthetics have never really done it for me. I, I find it to be a little bit of a boring watch. And also the fact that it's a two minute tourbillon is, kind of lame to me. I mean, uh, I want my tourbillon to spin as quickly as possible. I don't see any reason to slow it down, um, but uh, it's a great watch. Uh, that's it. Have I seen the new Grubel 4C? I have not in person. I just saw the pictures like everybody else. I've known about it for a while, but I, I haven't gotten to see it and I'm dying to, and it looks awesome. So yeah. Uh, hello from Rolex Service Center. I should be working right now. <laughs> yeah, probably, Ben. Um, but everybody's accustomed to their watch taking too long in service anyway. So what's an extra 20 minutes? Please don't start a discussion with gray market and mainstream bubbles. Okay. Ooh, Colton loves my glasses. You know, these are, um, I had LASIK uh, a while back, uh, but I still have these frames. And so I put, these are Garrett light and I put um, yellow, those, those like, uh, what do they call them? Yellow light or blue light blocking lenses that that's what they are. They're blue light blocking. They have a little bit of a yellow tint. And so I use them at my computer. I have no idea if they actually do anything good or not, but how can it hurt? Uh, which independent do I see exploding in popularity? Um, this is always hard to know. I'm not sure. I mentioned earlier, I think Kari Budalainen is still sort of underrated and undervalued. Um, anybody else? I don't know. I think actually Gerbil, they're really expensive, obviously. So there's not a ton of room to explode. But um, I've always thought that uh, they have an interesting place in the market. And if more people caught on, then the prices could go up quite a bit. Um, there's something about just being the absolute pinnacle and the best and the most expensive and whatever that all these guys that are now used to spending six, seven, eight hundred grand on a Richard Meal tourbillon, uh, I could see a certain percentage of them getting interested in Grubel. And I think this new sports watch is a, uh, a good way towards that. Oh, I didn't keep up here. Uh, keep up the great work, thank you. Richard Meal, good value for the money or too expensive? Uh, they're obviously too expensive, but they're still really cool watches, so whatever. The two, threes, and fours, I think, are good value for money right now. Opinion on Gerard Perigo. Uh, they have a lot of really cool watches. Um, uh, Three Bridge Tourbillon is like as nice as a watch could be. The Minute Repeater I reviewed a couple years ago was like stunning. But they do a really crap job of uh, running their brand and it hurts a lot. It makes it very difficult to buy or sell or own any of their pieces. Uh, oh yeah, and the Constant Force, also another one and a great value for what it is, but still crap brand. Better movement finish, Grubel 4C or Philippe Dufour, uh, Grubel 4C.
Where did I buy the large stone on my wall from? The one that has an X shape? Not sure what you're referring to. If it's the old art piece that was behind me in my old office, that's not a stone, it's a painting. And it's by a guy named Holton Rower. Do I ever see myself going back into the watch industry full time? I'm in the watch industry full time. But if you mean like running a brand again or something, um, probably not. Uh, look up James. Okay, I'll look him up. Uh, his wrist is under seven. My wrist is seven. I find that they fit. Sometimes with these bigger watches, you just have to kind of wear one for a little bit and you get used to it because a lot of it is just uh, it feeling too big uh, compared to whatever you're used to wearing. But as soon as you get used to it, uh, it, it actually works. And oftentimes they look good to everybody else. They just don't look good to you because you're used to looking at something else. Uh, what have I been hearing on the 1941 Remontoire? Been considering them? Um, well, Colton, they, they all sold out. They made 188 uh, movements and they're gone. Uh, I have another one on order, but there there's no more orders being taken from them. So when you say last six months, I've seen a significant jump. I don't know if you mean in value or in what, but uh, it's a great watch. Value for money is really great. The movement's beautiful. The size is really nice. There's a ton of different dials, so you can kind of get whatever you like. Um, it's a great, it's a really great watch. One of the most interesting independent releases of the last several years, for sure. Um, we'll skip a couple. Uh, what brands was I at before? Not familiar with your background. I started and ran MBNF North America. Uh, with Max. I was, I guess, employee number, I believe, four or five with MBNF. Um, that's it. No other. I never wanted to work in the watch industry or certainly in, at, at a brand level, but Max is the best, and that was a really cool job. Uh, how did I get my start in the watch industry? I have a video on that, I believe. Look back in my channel, and I think you can find it. Uh, do you follow some works of sole independent guys, HCI candidate level ones? Um, I do. I'm, I mean, I miss some like anybody else. Uh, so I, I follow whatever comes up that I can see. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, ben says, always buy new from an AD. I may or may not be a paid shill. Well, since Ben already told us that he's working at the Rolex Service Center, we we, <laughs> we know what's up there. Uh, I don't know. I sell only really pre-owned watches. I like the pre-owned market. Um, I guess I agree. If you're buying new, buy new from an AD. Or if you buy new from a non-AD, I just consider everything pre-owned. Um, you know, I have dealers try to sell me like new watches. But if it's a, a new watch coming from a guy on 47th Street, I just price it like pre-owned. Could I get a review of the VC Twin Beat Traditionnel? Uh, well, again, I don't know how to say it more often, but I only review what I own. So if I ever buy one, I will review it, but I don't buy a lot of big brand stuff, so it's unlikely. Ah, this computer's at a bad angle. I, got, I have to use my laptop to do these. Um, and it's tough. How'd I get into my current business? Uh, TikToking was actually a blog. I started back when everybody had blogs and I was uh, working with MBNF. I started a blog about my, like, it was kind of like an insider's perspective of the industry, like almost no photos, uh, sometimes 1,500 or 2,000 word posts, uh, very like kind of high level, not mainstream stuff. Uh, but Industry insiders paid attention, and it, it was a it was fun. And then I, I always used to buy and sell uh, my own watches, uh, just because I always wanted stuff. And uh, people then started asking me sometimes, "Hey, do you know where I can find a blah?" Or I'm trying to sell a blah, do you know a buyer. At some point, I was just like, eh, "Why don't I see about this as a business?" So I changed. 
TikToking from a blog to a commercial site. Um, I had a few watches, which I listed as inventory. I also listed a few uh, that belonged to a couple dealer friends for them. Um, and that was it. The rest is history. It took about six months of kind of figuring out exactly how the business worked and, and how to do it well. And then it was like kind of straight up and vertical after that. Thoughts on Saxonia Thin? Should I save more for a small seconds or 1815? I'm not your guy on Longa, really. There's other channels probably better for that. I would tell you to buy an independent watch. French Cisco, vintage doesn't appeal to you. I like vintage. I have some vintage watches myself. They were more interesting to me uh, when they were, you know, cheaper. Now everything's expensive. And every time I buy a vintage watch, I buy it and the person tells me everything's great and everything looks great to me and I check it out and it seems fine. And then every time I sell it, everybody gives me a hassle about uh, every little screw and hand and dial. It's too, it, people get lost um, in the details of those sorts of things and that stuff doesn't interest me. So uh, I don't like that part of vintage and that's become the whole market. And so I just stay out of it. Uh, where can I or we meet you? Uh, you can't. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know. I stay at home. I don't like to travel that much anymore. When I was doing the brand thing, I had to. But with this job, I don't really. Uh, and yeah, sorry. What's my opinion on Seiko's, Seiko's Micro Artist Studios work? Uh, I think that's like the Aishi. Somebody asked me about that earlier up. I've never seen one in person. They don't interest me that much, but I'm sure they're super high quality. Um, I had a chance to buy the uh, Grand Sonnery a few years ago and I chickened out because it was expensive and it's a Seiko. Uh, but in retrospect, I kind of wish I had bought it just so I would have gotten to play with it. Hello, Thomas. Uh, will green become the new blue? Oh, that would be cool. I like green. I'd love to see more green watches. I love green straps. If you look at my Instagram, you can see that I put a lot of my, my watches on green straps. I actually have one Jorn strap that is just kind of my strap. It's a little bit beat to hell. But every time I get a new Jorn in, if I want to wear it at all, I kind of put, that, put it on this green strap. Uh, and I have a green strap on the um, Grubel 4C technique that I have right now, which is like awesome. Uh, so yeah, green straps, very good. Uh, and yeah, I'd love to see green dials and stuff like that. Why not? Best chronograph in uh, or lingerie or independent space. The best independent chronograph is the Debethune, um Maxi Chrono, that's the that's the coolest independent Chrono for my money. Uh, are also the the Kari Vudalainen and Chronos that he made, uh, although they were a little bit too kind of like fancy for my personal wearing taste. And then if if you count all or lingerie, then the Datagraph and Double Split have to be mentioned in there. Do I think independents are or can influence the mainstream luxury watch industry design-wise? I think they definitely have. Um, yeah, 100%. Uh, best chrono Jorn Centigraph. I could see that. It's a good one too. It's not the best, uh, but it's a very cool one. If I wish to get a standard LM1 as a nicer non-sport strapped watch, what else should I know about living with it? Uh, nothing. Uh, it, they're they're really great watches. One of the cool things about MBNF is that uh, they all work really well. I've had very few service issues, and you know I used to be an executive with the brand, so I, I know a lot of watches that were delivered, and they all they all work well. And Max does really well with service, um, so it's a nice. They're nice watches to uh, wear quite a bit. Um, you say you don't baby whatever you're wearing. They don't need to be babied. Um, you know, just don't smash it. Uh, but I would suggest looking at the LM2 that I have on my site, uh, because LM2 is 
that much more awesome than LM1, and it's not even a, a huge premium in price. Do I have a unique piece in my own collection? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Uh, I've, I've talked about them before. I have an Oxen Junior, uh, which is kind of a bummer that the latest news about that company, but I have one that I specially made uh, for my son uh, that I'll give him when he's older, but we kind of made it together and it's got some personal engravings and stuff to him. And uh, I have a unique, uh, that, that unique car that I've mentioned several times. Um, the, yeah, some other stuff like that. Uh, my opinion on 39 versus 41 Royal Oaks. Uh, I don't know. I like 39. It fits well on me. I like the Royal Oak Perpetual. It's my favorite Royal Oak version. And the 41 Perpetual has that uh, weeks indicator on the outside, which I think is just ugly and unnecessary. So I do a 39 Perpetual. Uh, again, check the one on my site. That's It's my all-time favorite Royal Oak. Uh, Richard Mille RM11 versus Paddock 5270P. Wow. Definitely 5270P for like horological value. Uh, the RM11 though is super cool on the wrist. They're totally different to actually wear and own. Um, just depends if, if they're both even to you aesthetically, which is kind of crazy to me. It's like a comparing a Ferrari and a Tesla Model X or something. Um, but if they're even to you in every other way, then just do you want to pay for the hype around something or, you know, not? Uh, Dietrich, Perception, I don't know anything about it. Sorry. I can't know everything. Wow, been doing this for 32 minutes. Let's do a couple more. I'm gonna cut it off at like 35, so it's not totally insane long. If there are any more questions, I will try to get them here. Uh, favorite complication is a minute repeater or a grand sonnerie, anything chiming. Okay, I'm gonna cut it there. Thanks guys, this was fun. I'll try to do more of these uh, if you enjoyed it. Uh, save your questions up. Maybe I'll make it a uh, an every Friday thing if I can. All right. Cheers.